After a campaign marred by allegations of corruption, Horacio Cartes wins Paraguay's presidential election. What kind of leader will he be? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Have Ritansi. Cartes' victory marks a return to power for the Colorado Party, which ruled Paraguay for 61 years until 2008. He will fill a post left vacant after President Fernando Lugo's impeachment last year. Many on the left have argued Lugo's ousting amounted to a coup after his reform program was blocked by opposition from landowning elites and agribusiness interests. Cartes won out over his main challenger, Efrain Alegre, whose center-right Liberal Party took power following Lugo's removal. Cartes is a tobacco magnate and one of the country's richest men, owning banks, a sports team, and soybean farms. In the past, he's been arrested over allegations of currency fraud, has been investigated for alleged tax evasion, and been accused of drug trafficking by the U.S. Al Jazeera's Mariana Sanchez sent this report from Paraguay's capital, Asuncion. Celebrations at the Colorado Party headquarters. Horacio Cartes, who only became a politician four years ago, is now the president of Paraguay. I don't have the words to describe the way I feel, because now we have change. The president-elect vowed to deliver on his campaign promises. The great country of Paraguay is waiting for us and all Paraguayans are working together. From now on I just want to be a tool for all Paraguayans. I am at your service. Thank you. Long live the Republic of Paraguay. Long live the Republic. This victory means the return of the Colorado Party to power. A party that ruled Paraguay for 61 years and that supported Alfredo Stroessner, the military dictator, for 35 years. The 56-year-old tobacco millionaire, who's been in jail for fraud, has managed to convince voters that his business experience will be enough to lead the South American country. 67% of Paraguayans went to the polls on Sunday, with thousands of young people voting for the first time, like Alicia Amarillo. I am confused, but I voted because I think we need change. Nearly 40% of Paraguayans live in poverty and the economy is plagued by corruption. The next president has to make the most of these last five years of economic bonanza. Changes are much needed in education and health. But for now many Paraguayans are celebrating what they call the new face of the Colorado party. Mariana Sanchez Al Jazeera, Asunción, Paraguay. I'm joined now by Adrian Pine, who teaches anthropology at American University, specializing in Latin America. Craig Hetherington is in Montreal. He's the author of Guerrilla Auditors, Transparency, Democracy, and Rural Politics in Post-Cold War Paraguay. He teaches at Concordia University. And Nicholas Kozlov is in New York. He's the author of Revolution, South America, and the Rise of the New Left. Nicholas Kozlov, perhaps that is the starting point then, new, new face or not. It does seem amazing that a party, the Colorado Party, so associated with torture and repression and dictatorship is, such, is still such a major force in Paraguayan politics. Well, yeah, you said it. Uh, this is, for, uh, to my mind, uh, a really horrible outcome. The Colorado Party uh, supported this uh, Alfredo Stroessner dictatorship, which engaged in uh, persecution of nonviolent protesters, uh, uh, supported Nazi war criminals, uh, drug smuggling, uh, persecution of indigenous peoples. Uh, so we're, this is a really negative outcome. It's really disconcerting. I think it, I think it, uh, I, I hope that maybe this will prompt a sober reassessment on the part of the Paraguayan left and maybe the wider South American left, which has fallen on some hard times over the past few weeks. Uh, we could also cite the case of Venezuela, which uh, you know, Nicolas Maduro is hanging on just by a thread uh, in, the, in the recent election, much narrower uh, margin of victory than commonly expected. And I think what this reflects is a, a, a sort of collective failure of the South American left to reinvent itself. So 
Uh, if anything, I, I would hope this prompts a sober reassessment. Well, I think, I think we'll get on to that, 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 that regional context in, in a bit as to whether this is symbolic of the, the wider left in Latin America or something, or some specific Paraguayan factors are at play here. But uh, as far as the Colorado party, Professor Hetherington, is concerned, I mean, has it cleaned house following uh, Stresno? I mean, did, has there been a reckoning? Have, the, have the, the people who are responsible for the dictatorship, uh, are they a thing of the past? Um, well, they're a thing of the past in the sense that uh, we're 24 years on, um, but, uh, but no, the Colorado Party runs itself very much the way it has for, you know, since the late 19th century, um, as does the Liberal Party, which is their prime, uh, primary opposition party. Um, in a sense, I mean, although this is a very negative uh, outcome, um, on this, at this, by the same token, um, this is not at all surprising for those watching watching Paraguayan politics. This is uh, this isn't sort of a step backwards. It's just kind of business as usual. The real surprise in Paraguay was uh, was in 2008, the election of someone who was not Colorado, um, but no one really expected, even at that time, that that was likely to hold. So this is this is very much business as usual, both for the party and for um, the electorate in general. Well, let's take a, a closer look at uh, Horacio. Cartes. He is a newcomer to the Colorado party, certainly then, having joined that party only in 2009. He owns more than 20 companies. They include a bank, agricultural estates, tobacco plantations, and a soft drink bottler. Cartes and the Colorado party are backed by wealthy landowners and agricultural business. His supporters say his connections will help create new employment opportunities and bring foreign investment. Cartes was jailed for nearly a year in 1989 for illegal currency dealings, but he was later acquitted. In 2000, Paraguayan police seized a plane loaded with marijuana and cocaine that had landed on one of his farms, but Cartes denies any ties to drug traffickers. He says the plane had simply made an emergency landing. Adrian, what, what are we to make of this man? Actually, there was relatively limited media access to him, and when he did speak, I don't know, it was pretty controversial. Or maybe it helped his, his base, I don't know. I mean, he made some homophobic comments and some other, you know, some other things. But, I mean, wh who is this man? Well, you're right about the homophobic comments. He explicitly compared gay people to monkeys and then said he would shoot himself in the testicles if his son were to marry another man. So that has, there's been much mention made of that. But I think... Um, perhaps even more worrisome is the fact that this is somebody who the DEA has investigated for drug trafficking, who um, set up a, a bank with no actual building and no employees in the Cook Islands, um, for, which was basically for laundering money in the 90s, and, um, you know, follows a pattern of, uh, of wealthy landowners and um, and businessmen in Latin America who have come to power um, and ha who have received the support of the United States. And I, I think the U.S. Um, uh, rubber stamping both of the coup that set the stage for the election of Cortes um, and, the, you know, this pattern of the U.S. Uh, backing people like Uribe in Colombia or Miguel Facuse in Honduras um, and their relationship to the destabilization in those countries is, is very worrisome. Well, there was a WikiLeaks cable uh, that, that um, we have from January 2010 and on Cortes it says, quote, this is a diplomatic cable, uh, Agents have successfully focused investigative activity in an effort to develop this investigation with an aim toward a DEA UC introduction to CPOT designee Horatio Cartes. CPOT stands for Consolidated Priority Organizational Target. Uh, through the utilization of a DEA BACO cooperating source, lots of acronyms and things here, and other DEA undercover personnel, agents have infiltrated Cartes' money laundering enterprise, an organization believed to launder large quantities of United States currency generated through illegal means, including through the sale of narcotics from the TBA to the United States. Now, TBA is the tri-border area, though that's that, the area that borders Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. Nicholas Kosov, I mean, have we seen overt U.S. support then for Cartes, despite the sort of reservations and, and allegations, in fact, being communicated between embassies uh, on, and, and embassy personnel in the U.S.? Well, I'd really, personally, I would really like to clarify what uh, Washington's role is precisely in Paraguay uh, now and over the past few years. Um, uh, particularly in the, in the military realm, there's a lot of um, uh, shenanigans suggested in these WikiLeaks cables. And uh, I, I think that um, Americans deserve to know what precisely Washington is doing in Paraguay. Officially, 
Uh, you know, the Pentagon has de deployed special forces uh, over time to Paraguay officially to uh, to look into uh, to assist in rural um, rural assistance, humanitarian relief. But there have been consistent allegations by human rights monitors, others, that the U.S. troops are there to identify rural uh, leaders. Uh, and uh, land tenure remains in a very intractable problem in Paraguay. Uh, your other guests mentioned rural poverty. And so I think Americans do need to know, what is Washington up to in the military arena in Paraguay? And it's very suspicious. As soon as Lugo, the, the former leftist president, was removed, uh, he had balked a bit about uh, in terms of uh, U.S.-Paraguayan military collaboration. And as soon as Lugo was out of the picture, uh, the new president uh, or his administration conducted meetings with U.S. generals. And so I would like to know, what is the U.S. military up to in the Chaco region? Uh, it's a remote region of uh, Paraguay, which is thought to contain oil. And so I think we need a lot more clarity about the U.S. role in, in terms of Paraguayan politics. Uh, Adrian Pan, I know you've been looking at that region quite closely well, as well. Well, um, yeah, in fact, uh, just two days ago, there was an announcement that um, came out, I believe from InfoSuroi, but from, from the Southcom, saying that Southcom and the Paraguayan Air Force and military were going to be holding joint exercises, joint military exercises in the Chaco, um, the Paraguayan Chaco region starting in June. So um, that's definitely something that is on the, immediate um, in the immediate future. Uh, Professor Hetherington, clearly some American multinationals, Monsanto and others, and agribusiness companies, mining companies, did rather well out of, or at least in the immediate aftermath of Lugo's ouster, they did rather well. But is there any evidence, any dis direct linkages between these companies and the U.S. government, perhaps, and others in, in that ouster? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think uh, it's it's certainly tempting to look for those kinds of things, and one never knows exactly what's going on behind the behind the scenes and all this stuff. But the 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 people who are planting soybeans and who are running the soybean chain in Paraguay, and this is this is where the money has been flooding into Paraguay over the last uh, ten years, um, were were extremely distraught over over Lugo, who did very tepid attempts at regulating the industry um, in environmental and health matters and, and a little bit even less in terms of uh, kind of land distribution. Um, so they were, they were always vociferously against uh, the Lugo government and worked tirelessly to try to take them down. So I don't think that, um, that those companies necessarily had to do very much. Um, the, the, the soy lobby in Paraguay is extremely strong. It works on its own, uh, on its, its own logic, um, and it was happy to take Lugo down and to have either the Liberals or the Colorados in, party, uh, in power it really makes very little difference. To Nicholas Kosov, what did if go I, so wrong can, with, with Lugo? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, he didn't seem to be making much headway, and in fact, he seemed to be quite a good figurehead for some of these interests, because at least they could say, look, well, we have, you know, we have this red priest or whatever you know, in charge, even though he, you know, he couldn't really do anything. What, why was he overthrown, do you think? Well, I think... Well, he was overthrown because uh, the, the rightist uh, backward elements in Paraguay are very politically powerful. But I also think it reflects, as I was saying before, uh, a lack of um, a, a, an inability to galvanize the, the population, to really galvanize social movements in Paraguay behind his presidency. And you see quite clearly in the WikiLeaks cables that Lugo was trying to appease the Americans. Um, he even outsourced his own communications department to the U.S. Embassy, which is ridiculous. So I think it, what it reflects is a, a lack of um, preparedness on the part of the Paraguayan left. And I think my concern is just more widely in South America now, uh, you know, the left is, is beginning to encounter problems, not just in Paraguay and Venezuela, uh, but, but also in Venezuela. And so I think uh, maybe uh, the Paraguayan left and the South American left should be thinking about how do they reinvent themselves at this point. But, uh, and I, to my mind, I think Lugo wasn't nearly as, as uh, um, radical as he could have been, particularly on, on land reform. And I think when push came to shove, uh, Paraguayan civil society did not support him to the degree that um, might have been possible precisely because he was not strong enough. But, but what is the, I mean, in the, even in this election, for example, why would... I mean, you'd think there would be rather a large constituency, Adrian, uh, for change and moving away from big business and for the, away from the oligarchy that's, that's pushed such unequitable development over the, 
you know, over the last decades. I mean, what, where, are, where is that constituency then? Well, certainly around Asuncion, um, around the capital and um, in other places in Paraguay, you could see um, graffiti that said, our dreams don't fit in your ballot boxes. I mean, there's certainly a sense of discontent with this election. And I think, again, the context of this election harkens both back to the coup. I mean, that's the immediate context that, that set the stage for um, an election that may have appeared free and fair, but didn't have um, the elements that were necessary um, to provide democracy, because the coup itself had not been resolved. Um, some call it a constitutional coup, others call it a, a soft coup. But the fact is, it was a coup, and it was a coup that was modeled after the Honduran coup that happened in 2009, and that learned from it, and learned lessons that enabled it to better um, uh, prevent the kind of uprising that happened in Honduras, and ultimately, with the aid of the U.S. government, was able to be rendered um, less powerful, against, uh, rendered unimportant, really, against the, the government that was put in place through illegitimate elections but, but in that country. Do you agree with Nicholas, Adrian, that, that, that this might, be, might reflect a wider malaise currently amongst the left in Latin America as a whole, or are there specific Paraguayan is there a specific Paraguayan context to, to, to well, take Well, I mean, I, th I think Paraguay uh, has, uh, of course, the specific context is always important. And then the broader context, and uh, I mean, he mentioned Maduro and the, the pressure that's on Venezuela right now, that has to be taken into account as well. But the specific context um, of Paraguay includes, of course, this history of the Stroessner dictatorship and then the longer Colorado Party rule, but also this pressure that the U.S. government has been putting um, to bear in support of large corporations like Monsanto or like the Rio Tinto Alcan company, which is a Canadian company, all of which uh, benefited greatly from the coup. And it's also important to mention this, not only the U.S. military and the State Department, but USAID has played a central role in um, controlling the judiciary, the attorney general's office, the um, the national police, it has cooperative agreements um, with all of those institutions, with the public ministry, um, to which they are they're subject to uh, those agreements. Uh, Professor Hethington, I mean, we've we mentioned in passing on the poverty in, in the rural areas and the effects of agribusiness and, and the power of those lobbies, but what, what real effect uh, have these interests had on the countryside and on the, the peasant communities and the subsistence communities in the countryside of Paraguay? Well, um, the past 10 years, or basically maybe 15 years since the introduction of genetically modified soybeans, um, we're talking about a complete destruction of uh, traditional um, campesino communities in, in the countryside. So it went from having uh, rural, rural agriculture that, although it had lots of large players in it, was also had a very strong smallholder base. Um, that has been decimated by the rapid, rapid expansion of monocropped um, soybeans uh, really since the late 1990s. So that's the, that's the economic, the ecological, and the social state of the countryside. And it's meant um, whatever base there might have been for, um, for kind of organized discontent in rural areas has been, uh, has been you know, quite rapidly disarticulated um, by, by this, this new agricultural behemoth. So uh, it's really huge. And at the same time, I mean, not only are all these companies benefiting, but um, as soon as soybeans came online as a, as a, as a major export, uh, Paraguay, in, in national economic terms, was lifted out of a, of a massive economic crisis that had been going on for over a decade. So, um, so this, you know, it, it articulated with a great deal of oligarchic interests all across the board, and it's, a, it's something that's just very difficult to touch. And the fact that Lugo didn't do very much about it, I mean, on the one hand, um, it, it's very disappointing to those of us who wish he had done more. Um, on the other hand, it's not at all surprising. It's, a, it's almost taboo to imagine him doing anything. And the, the coalition, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the previous question. When we talk about the fate of the left in Paraguay, it's worth remembering that 10 years ago, the left in Paraguay didn't exist. And, and this, is, this makes it very different in the, in the whole um, Latin American context. There's very, very little that we could call um, actually an organized left. And what brought Lugo to power was a strange coalition of a very small sliver of leftist groups of institutional reformers who were really liberals, um, and the Liberal Party, which Big L Liberal, which is a which is a traditional um, uh, party like everything else, and so Lugo and the left within that coalition had 
very, very little uh, possibility to, to do anything. And ironically, in a sense, um, with this election, there are more senators and more uh, congresspeople from the leftist parties who have gotten in than ever before. So, so there is a Including way in which Lugo, there's actually, <laughs> a, although very moderate, Including Lugo, who now becomes a, a, a senator, um, and a couple of other people within his party. Now, the, the f left after the coup became very fractious and, and was uh, very difficult to organize. But, um, but the sort of sum total of the people voting for leftist parties is way above what it's ever been before. Except under Lugo, which, as I said, because it was a coalition, it's very hard to kind of gauge that as a, as a leftist vote. But what about local resistance, though, on the Campesino level? I mean, is there, is there, I mean there seems to be a, a pretty constant low-level state of violence underway there in the countryside, isn't there? Yes, and so this is, I mean, this is going to be one of the things that, that we'll really have to watch out for the, the, la, the next little while because um, the, soybean, the, the soybean phenomenon really brought with it an increase in the violence of, uh, of uh, sort of confrontations between large landholders and, small, and smaller um, landholders. Um, and with Lugo coming to power, that actually calmed down quite a bit. Um, and one could criticize the Lugo government for having sort of placated uh, the, the whatever resistance there was in the countryside with these kind of false hopes which never materialized. Now that we have an oligarch in power who is just incredibly clearly linked to large agribusiness interests, um, it's, it'll be uh, interesting and a bit scary to figure to see what happens to those forces of resistance now that they've moved back into the countryside and, and are trying to figure out what to do in a in an electoral panorama which is which is impossible to penetrate and and, and in a and in a general situ political situation that's very pessimistic so what are the lessons of Lugo then Nicholas Kozlov I mean you talk about you know st stepping back and looking at strategy moving forward if you do want an equitable Paraguay I mean what what, what, what should we look at then well uh Moving back to that wider question of uh, what's next for the left in, in South America, I think um, one, one question on my mind is how is Brazil going to reconcile itself to this uh, rightist government, these rightist governments in Paraguay that are so entrenched with the landholding interests? And there's, there's one um, very, very pressing problem, uh, which is these, um, there's like 350,000 Brazilians who settled in Paraguay. They're called pejoratively Brasiguayos. And they're just carpeting all of Paraguay with this soybeans. And so uh, from a social economic standpoint, they really represent a backwards force in Paraguayan society. And so I think maybe uh, what the wider question is, how is Brazil, which has ostensibly a leftist government in power, how is it going to respond uh, to uh, you know, entrenched interest in Paraguay? Is it going to try and back up its agricultural interests in Brazil? Uh, because you have different sides of, uh, you know, there's an idealistic side of the workers' party in power, but on the other hand, you have big agribusiness in, in power in Brasilia. And I think this is a very, um, this is a thorny problem for the South American left because Brazil is a little internally divided about what it wants to do in its own near abroad in Paraguay and these neighboring countries. And so I would hope that social movements in Brazil, the landless squatters uh, and other social movements ally to the Paraguayan left such as it is, to, so as to overcome the, this uh, entrenched rightist uh, political machine in Paraguay. There are things stand, Adrian. I mean, it looks like economic relations, uh, you know, membership of Mercosur, uh, the trading bloc, and you know, they, they are about to be normalized, actually, aren't they, after this result? Um, yeah, I, we do expect that. Um, although UNASUR did uh, come out and say that, um, it, that they found irregularities in the election, Mercosur, which is a different entity, will most likely bring Paraguay back in because these are ostensibly fair, free and fair elections. So what do you think is the strategy moving for, for the left? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I would echo what both of the other guests have said is, first of all, that, um, that the electoral strategy is, is not one um, that is particularly effective right at this mo moment in time for the Paraguayan left because there's such tight control um, by the landholding elite. And remember, this is a country in which two, um, around 2% of the population owns around 80% of the land. And you know that 2% that is who is reflected in the Congress. Um, so I agree um, that, uh, that I think that these um, extra electoral strategies cross uh, South American extra electoral strategies working with the landless people's movements um, 
in, uh, in Brazil and elsewhere is going to really be key because um, with the growth of monocrop um, genetically modified uh, uh, agriculture, we're, we're really seeing more and more and more landless people, and I think that that is going to be the strongest platform for struggle there and throughout much of Latin America. Adrian Pine, thank you very much. Professor Craig Hetherington, thank you. Nicholas Kozlov, thank you as well. And that's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.